would you would you uh, uh, tell us uh, what what uh, what are you doing right right now? What are you researching? Mm -hmm. So for some of your projects. Yes, sure. Uh, so okay, I'm Jan Kran. Uh, I work at the Josef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, I work at the Department of Knowledge Technologies. Um, particularly, my research uh, focuses on uh, machine learning and network mining in a network setting, which means that I'm interested in studying data sets which have um, a, a network structure. Uh, so I don't just have in data instances, but I have instances that are interlinked in some sort of network. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, my area of research is uh, uh, data which is connect in somehow connected in a network setting. So uh, I try to both ex extract knowledge by both exploiting the data itself and the way that the data instances are connected with each other. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail, but uh, so um, I got into uh, this research by studying mathematics in uh, university. So I have a master's in mathematics. And during my mathematics studies, I drifted from the more theoretical mathematics into more applied uh, numerical mathematics. And then it was just one, one step further to, to machine learning and um, what I'm doing now. Um, and the projects I'm most um, involved in are, well, for one, I am a project on my own, so I'm a junior researcher, so um, my mentor is receiving funding for my PhD studies. And uh, next to that, we're also involved in, uh, in the Human Brain Project, which is a, you know, it's a you know, European flagship project. And then several other projects, especially with uh, the Institute of Biology, which uh, we consider a nice sort of source of uh, data for our experiment. So, um, and you want on your research and project? Uh, okay. And uh, well, I'm a PhD student in philosophy of science in the uh, New Bulgarian University in Sofia. I'm now in my last months of my second year of PhD. And um, I became interested in philosophy of science through, uh, well, I began with a general interest in what's going on around us. Of course, that immediately implies going into science. But before, before that, I was kind of um, into the question okay, how do we know from different hypotheses or theories in science, which is the most confirmed by the evidence that we got? And this is, as it turns out, a philosophical question which brought me to philosophy of science and in fact to a uh, particular information theory, which is uh, the field in philosophy of science which deals with exactly the question, what is the connection between hypothesis, scientific hypotheses and theories and the evidence and data that we have? And I did a master's uh, thesis on the topic. So I, in my master's thesis, I defended um, the well, the, the pros of the Bayesian approach in confirmation theory, and I compared it to other classical approaches which were in the literature. But I don't want to to get into more technical details here. And for a PhD project, I continued the trend, as you might say. Uh, but I now explore um, the connection between scientific confirmation, so the connection between evidence and hypothesis and theories in science is confirmatory, but also the connection between confirmation and explanation. So I am also interested in how scientific hypothesis and theories explain the data that we have. And in particular, I'm trying to build a Bayesian explication of inference to the best explanation. So inference to the best explanation tells us that out of many hypotheses and theories, which we uh, should choose the one that best explains the evidence, and it is the most probable or the closest to the truth. Um, but this is inference to the best explanation doesn't have a really good um, explication, formal explications up to that point. 
So there is a debate whether it's compatible with Bayesianism and with Bayesian confirmation theory or it isn't. So I'm on the side that it is and I'm trying to, to show how it is compatible. What motivates your research? What what actually drives your research? Uh, could you tell us, tell me a bit more about that. Uh, well, I'm my origins are in mathematics, so there's uh, I think mathematics is probably the flagship science which does uh, research for research sake, at least in the in at least the more theoretical parts of mathematics, but. Um, so in part, of course, it always has to be curiosity, which drives um, any research. I mean, uh, curiosity is especially not only drives, but it motivates the researcher. So if I wouldn't be curious about if I if I would just get a new idea and wouldn't be curious whether it works or not, then I would never get the motivation to actually do it. Um, but uh, as I am also working on some projects, um, uh, my, uh, my specific field of research is directed by what, what is needed. So um, I will, mm, my research mainly is uh, developing and improving uh, algorithms for machine learning or for data comprehension, let's say. Um, and this, which which direction I will go depends also on the data that I have at hand and the data that I have to um, that I have to analyze. Um, but overall, I would say that my uh, the motivation for new research comes in looking at what I already have and then being curious about um, re reading uh, reading a lot about how this data was already tackled, what was already done with it, and uh, going through my own personal library of what I know that could be done, trying to find new ways to, to look at the data. And so, as I think most of most scientific research can be in some way or, or other explained by uh, this brilliant scientist looked at this data in this new way and got a new explanation and um, I mean I'm not saying I'm a brilliant scientist uh, but uh, all scientists try to find uh, some new way of looking at things which will maybe be an easier explanation maybe be a simpler and more effective explanation of the data so um, yeah so uh, my research is directed by um, necessity and driven by curiosity you could say okay thank you i, I completely uh, agree with the point uh, about being interested in what's going on around you that's what brought me to philosophy in the first place and well um that's that's really the the the, the greatest motivation that actually drive and still drives my heart um I'm doing my own project, so I don't depend on anyone, uh, you know, projects or ideas that I have to just uh, go on board and, and develop. I'm, I'm completely driven by my interest with chart, which is very good. I'm glad about that. Um, and, uh, well, I would say that I'm about, I don't know, 50-50 would be like too, too simpli simpli a simplification of, of uh, the motivation, but I would say that internal motivation, so I'm uh, into philosophy of science because I'm interested in the questions that I uh, research, like scientific information, scientific information, and so on, but I would be uh, dishonest if I say that it's just the internal motivation and no external motivation is uh, uh, is there. So, of course, funding is more or less important. I wouldn't be able to do what I'm interested in doing if I didn't have the the financial means to do it. So, yeah. uh, I would be lying if I say that it's just my internal motivation and I'm, you know, completely unfazed by any external factors.
would you say that uh, how, how would you define creativity? It's a, it's a very interesting question for me. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. In fact, uh, my my department has also just finished a series of projects which was on computational creativity, which was um, an in the general sense, we have intelligence and then we want to make artificial intelligence, but humans also have creativity. And so can we also make com computers creative? And there was an ongoing debate, which is still ongoing, is uh, how can we make computers creative if we don't actually, can't even agree between each other what, what creative is. So, um, I remember a nice uh, presentation by Professor Simon Colton, who made a computer program which was able to paint paintings. And uh, he, he said he's not focusing on what, com what creativity is, but what, what it isn't. So what he was doing was his uh, program was always, uh, he always explained exactly how the computer comes to uh, its ideas to make the paintings it makes and then he asked people so do you think this is creative and of course because it was made by a computer people said no and then he just waited and he said but why is it why is it not creative and with whichever the response he got he always addressed that next complaint why is it not creative well it's uh it's not it's only doing something from inside and then he added an algorithm which was influenced by outside events and was looking at are people right now happy or not and so now it is is it now is it now creative well it's not but why isn't it it's now it is affected by outside events and then so um overall i think it's hard to say what what creativity is apart from the nebulous trying to coming up with ideas which did not exist yet in the world before, but um, I guess, I don't know, in my personal philosophy, I'd say creativity and new lines in the network of knowledge, new lines or new nodes in the network of knowledge that humans have. So um, knowledge and or, and or art. Um, but in, in the role of scientific science, creativity means um, either developing new ways to, to, to look at existing things or to, to discovering new things to look at. So um, I would say the example of a theory of uh, evolution, the creative step was trying to think of a new way of how would these, this abundance of species coexists come about um, so we try to find a new explanation for an existing thing or in the case of I'm trying to think of a way of what would be a, the case of um, discovering a new thing maybe theory of gravity but this is again a new an explanation of an existing thing um, so maybe more I'm not sure. Maybe I'm now leaning more towards um, new ways to look at um, things that looking at things in a way that wasn't done before. So looking at connections that did not exist. Again, we have a, a an example that we always share in our um, in some of our projects is it was an explanation of how. Um, by associations were formed in, uh, we, we call them by associations, but uh, associations were formed from two distinct fields of research and one was about something about chemistry and the other was about, um, about health. So uh, there was a field of research which covered the fact that I think low levels of magnesium in in the bloodstream can cause um, can cause migraines in people, and then there was a completely separate field of research where they showed that um, drinking some sort of fish oil or some some nutrient increases the amount of magnesium in the bloodstream, and the creative research was uh, trying to, to 
to put these two together and let's try to mitigate the consequences of migraine using uh, some new medicine which which targets something else in the in the beginning. I don't know if I'm rambling. Sorry. Yeah, yes. Well, I was uh, I was about to say that it's not only about discovering new things, but uh, discovering the connections between things that are already there, but you, you, you uh -huh. said, it. <laughs> <laughs> said it. So it may be a lot of different things. It could be, you know, discovering things that uh, we haven't known before. It could be, well, learning new connections between already existing things. And it seems that we have very different definitions of creativity in different fields, like in cognitive science, uh, they have another definition of creativity, which is quite different from everyday understanding of creativity, like coming up with a new idea. And it seems that in computer science, there is a difference as well, as you, as you just said. And well, in philosophy, we can say one definition could be that uh, we follow an empathic method. So we follow a logical method, which, uh, or prob probabilistic one, which comes up with results which are not in the premises themselves. So it comes up with new information, in fact, but not new information about the logical connections, uh, but actually something new, we we'll discover something new. And, um, well, the, the, an interesting question as well is, well, um, the role of creativity in our own research. So uh, do you follow any kind of I don't know, heuristic or pattern when you do your own research uh, in order to be creative, in order to come up with something new, either as, as yeah. over your connections between, between stuff that we already know? Um, I think in this, in, in my research, the, um, I'm not actively trying to say, okay, let's be creative, let's be creative, because that's the best way to stifle any new idea because we'll, you'll always just be under stress of I'm not thinking of anything new right now. Um, but um, I think the best way in research is to be exposed to a lot of ideas, to a lot of existing ideas because in the knowledge network of humanity if you want to draw a new line you have to know as many nodes as possible to know to get the idea to draw a line between two things. So, for example, the research I'm working on now, uh, I'm trying to uh, connect um, the field of more network analysis uh, techniques in in data mining and uh, something called semantic data mining. Um, so, in my idea is to to look at um, the no, the background biological knowledge of genes uh, in a different way. So um, I think this idea, if it works, is a nice example of this. Let's look at this thing that already exists in a different way and try try to attack it with methods that weren't uh, that weren't applicable on it before. But uh, this idea came about from by me knowing both both sides of the argument. So the the creative part comes in when you're when you're when you see the two similar things and asking yourself the question: Wait, are these things somehow related? Can I can I draw a connection between them? But you can only get this idea by by being exposed to as many as many views already as possible. So you want to do something. You have to be able to draw a lot of parallels between things that already exist and things that other people have done, and then trying to do something similar in your own research. So I'd say creativity is something that pops up once you have enough experience. And I think that's also similar in art. I, I can't just get up and uh, draw a Picasso. If I, I, if I would want to be a good painter, I would have to train myself to paint well and to paint in different styles and to, to, to see the world in different ways. And after a while, I would maybe get the idea, after having a lot of knowledge already, I would then be able to, to, to do something new about it.
So yeah. I'm not exactly how sure creativity appears, but it, the, the necessary condition for it is, I guess, practice, knowledge, experience. Absolutely. In fact, I, I read one of your articles, and you're not only connecting things that already exist, but this Hedwig uh, uh, system isn't it your development? No, it's uh, but it is on our department, so it's developed okay. by my colleagues, by Angela Albertini. Yeah. So back on the on the topic of creativity, I would say that uh, I'm not a great believer of talent either, because I I, di I didn't hear you say anything about talent, and I'm not a great believer of talent either. I, I would say that. Uh, talent plays a very small part. Of course, I've seen people do uh, very productive work in far less time than I would imagine. So I, I kind of expected that this thing should take very much longer and uh, some people actually manage to do it in short term. But I believe that any kind of genius or talent doesn't go uh, successful without putting his or her back into it. So. Hard work is involved either way. Uh, what you get by means of, uh, you know, computationally powerful brain, this comes by nature, so we cannot change this. But what you can change actually is uh, how much hard work you're willing to, and you're putting into your project. So I would agree again with you on that point that creativity is requires a certain level of experience, meaning that you have to uh put a lot of work before you can get any creative ideas out and with me it's more or less the same so my so-called creative process is i would say not very different than the creative process of any or more most phd students so you read a lot and um after you read a lot, no the first phase in fact is you uh, choose the important things that you should read. Then you read a lot. And then you try to reconstruct what you read uh, in order to see whether you actually got it or not. Because when you try to reconstruct it, some of the things that you thought you got, in fact, come out as you didn't got them. You don't understand this theory. Mm -hmm. And in this pro process, it takes as long as it takes. You hope that at some point you connect to dots that were previously not connected, or you see the position of some other dot, something that no one else thought about. And well, that's creativity for, for me, personally. Promotion of science, would you say that promotion, uh, promoting science to the general population is a good thing as a whole, or not, and uh, how it should be done? Um. I overall, of course, I would I think it's a good thing. Um, again, I'll say I'm a mathematician by origin. So um, the one thing that really annoys me about people is um, whenever I mention the fact that I studied mathematics, the first reply is, and any mathematician will tell you this, the first reply is, oh, I always hated math. Oh, I was never good at math. Oh. But um, I guess my, my reply to that is, well, that's why you have us, so you don't have to bother with it. Um, but um, so uh, overall, I think science has a bad rap um, in, in the fact that a lot of people consider scientists uh, um, uh, introverted people who are only interested in doing what they do because of their own uh, Curiosity and just doing their thing without um, without any outward benefit or without any um, um, I guess sucking up pub public funds for for their own amusement I guess um, um, yeah promoting science uh, especially educating the general public is something I consider more or less vital for the Western civilization. Um, as um, we are in the world where we are, good things and bad all together, because of the scientific breakthroughs in the last 300 years. Um, science is what raised the average life expectancy 
by a factor of two in the last 150 years. It's it's what killed tuberculosis. It's what annihilated child paralysis. It's what got us to the moon. It's also what got us Hiroshima. But uh, overall, if you look at the state of the world now and compare it to any other point in human history, it's it, it is beyond compare. Um, so uh, and the problem is that what if uh, people forget what brought us here and start to mistrust science and even more than science, the scientific method and the, the rational way of looking at the world. Uh, this can all go downhill quickly if people stop to, to think rationally, I guess. Um, so this that would be an overall statement. But uh, in, in my general field, um, with promotion of science, I'm lucky enough that I'm, uh, what I'm doing is fairly easy to explain in general terms. So uh, it's fairly easy to explain to people what a network is, in, and it's more or less easy to explain to them that, okay, I'm doing something with these networks by trying to learn something from the network. Um, but uh, my field is machine learning. And machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence. And people have watched Terminator before. Um, so I, I, the field that I'm working on is uh, open to misconceptions from the public. And without us explaining what we're doing and how what we're doing will not end the world, if we don't do that, uh, people will soon, I guess, turn against us and uh, be mistrustful, mistrustful, trustful of what we're doing. Um, so, I guess now, now the way I'm explaining it, it almost seems like it's a necessary evil to, if we, if my field doesn't explain to people what we're doing, people will start to uh, mistrust us. But I don't think it's it's just a necessary evil. I also think that um, people need to know what we're doing so that people can get curious about what we're doing. And so that people can start to also be interested in what we're doing and maybe join us and maybe help us. We're not some elite clique which does things that no other people can do. We are people who are interested in things and other people can also get interested in these things. So uh, it's important that the new generations of also new generations of parents know what artificial intelligence and machine learning is, so that when their children ask them what this is, they don't just say, "Oh, it's some hocus pocus that some people in the white lab coat are doing," but that they explain to them that this is uh, these are methods and uh, the ways people are doing things and improving our world, and maybe these children then get interested in the same thing. So it's uh, overall vital for our society that science has a, that people have a positive outlook on science, because we need people in science and we need good people in science to do good work, and we get that by people being interested in what we do and people and children being uh, interested in what we do. Um, in connection with this topic, does does your does your field have? Um, uh, civilian science projects. So, do you involve civilians in in any uh, in any way? In because in some fields, uh, in some scientific fields, there are uh, projects which involve civilians. Like in astronomy, we have not we, of course, but astronomers have um, civilians looking at data. So, looking at uh, photos from deep space and classifying uh, what they see and uh, well what scientists found out that in fact while actual people are doing it is a lot faster and a lot more accurate than leaving it to another and do it so they involve actually amateur amateur astronomers and even civilians into in this kind of uh, scientific research so I was wondering whether in, in computer science there isn't a venue for, for, for civilians to do actual work in it. So help a little bit, even if not experts. Uh, I can't think of an example of, of that, but uh, I would say a, a sort of related example would be the recent uh, 
way that uh, Google, the company, um, is making all of its machine learning and AI software open source. So it's what, what Google's doing is uh, what's uh, what they're developing developing is called TensorFlows, and it's basically the structure that allowed them to win win at Go a year and a half ago. Um, but uh, it's possible for anyone to just go on the particular website that they that they set up and download all of the all of the software that they used and run it on their own computers. Um, I don't know of a case where actually people like that would actually join into a project. Um, but um, the thing is that it's not hard for, for us to accept a new person into, into some project. We, uh, the, the knowledge that we require, uh, the hardware that we require is a computer and a keyboard. So it's not hard for us to accept new members. Uh, uh, for example, astronomy is different. You need you need specific equipment to. You, you need a telescope to do astronomy, probably. Um, but everyone has a computer, so uh, I think people are already doing more machine. They 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 think about because people just say, "Oh, I want to do something that Google is already doing. Let's try it," and then they. They can get into to machine learning by by being curious about what some other cool company is doing, but I don't know of a case where I would be, we would be held by civilians. Um, on the topic of promotion of science, uh, I am uh, for promotion of science, of course, uh, when done properly, uh, and I I don't suppose that there are many people in either science or philosophy of science who could be against the promotion of science. Uh, that would be kind of strange. Um, but the idea is that too, many uh, too much attention has been paid to the uh, topic of whether uh, the media covers scientific projects and the results uh, in a good way. And I think that that's connected to, uh, as well, a very, a very important topic, which is well, uh, how can we not train but teach the general populace, not we, of course, definitely philosophers, but scientists and uh, people who are doing science, to filter out uh, results which are badly covered or, or uh, the yellow pages in the media from actual scientific results? Because it's not just the media, the media's responsibility to cover it well. It's also the people's own responsibility to filter out good information from the bad. And, um, it's getting increasingly difficult with uh, fake news media and so social media and um, rage propagation of news, I guess. Of course, that, that, that's why the, the, maybe the, the problem falls more heavily on the people managing to filter out that bad information by themselves uh, rather than censoring the media and saying, well, look, you will hire experts and just the experts will see what you can cover, that's it. Uh, you're not allowed to speak, you know, rubbish about science. Um, and about philosophy of science, of course, philosophy of science would be, uh, as most parts in philosophy, it also, I believe, has a bad image, a bad um, public relations image. So there are questions like whether it is needed, actually, whether it does something that's productive, or whether it's uh, any good with scientists or not. Uh, so this could be, in, in my view, amended with even more effort put in um, telling the general public in a meaningful and clear way what we do and how it is connected with science and why it is important and even more to hear scientists on the side of science saying that, well, they found uh, something useful and something meaning meaningful in philosophy of science, that, that would actually be even of more help. Would you tell us a few words about your future research plans? What do you intend to do from the one? Um, so my research now is my, my plans for 
the near uh, future are um, I sort of have two threads of research uh, both connected to network analysis going on so um, uh, my immediate plans are to wrap both of them up and um, to, to wrap them up in a nice package which would, which would carry my name in, in front um, the more long-term plans are the uh, the important dilemma of researchers are uh, industry versus academia, right? So um, I'm, I would I, I fully support that. I think uh, industry, uh, especially people in my field of research, which is machine learning. Uh, I think I ne we definitely need to be exposed to, to some industrial environment, to some um, some environment where we need the results and we need them now and we need them yesterday. Um, so I, in my student years, I was already working on some programming. Um, so I already was exposed to the uh, industrial parts of. Um, of my possible career, um, but uh, recently I was also uh, last year was my first time being able to teach uh, a course on I'm uh, being an assistant on a course on machine learning, um, and I was always interested in um, I I always found it fun to teach I always found it exciting to, to, to explain things to people who didn't know it and to see in their eyes that, oh, now you got it. Um, so I would never, I don't want to completely abandon uh, the academic world. I, I want to, uh, once I have enough knowledge, I also want to pass it down. And uh, passing down of knowledge has to be in some sort of um, academic way where um, in some in some way where the bottom line is not the only thing that counts, but the, um, but I would also like to be um, I don't know yet in in two years, but um, I would like to be maybe exposed to some or maybe work on a project with um, a company which is interested in the final result of the project, not only the uh, the method but also the result. So, um, yeah, um, my, my plan would be to reach out, but um, not sway completely out of the academic waters. And yours, Anton? Well, my, mine are more or less the same. Uh, my immediate plans for the future are finishing my PhD, of course. Uh, and uh, after that, and in the meantime, I hope that I have uh, publishable results, which are, of course, a very good thing to have um, in, a, in the beginning of an academic career. And uh, after that, I always thought that in the philosophy of science, there are quite many questions which, uh, which it is possible to be tested empirically, but they're not reformulated as empirical questions. Of course, we cannot get the answer to every question in an empirical way, but I think that there is much bread in, into going empirical into some questions in, in philosophy of science. So if I'm given the freedom, on it, because in my PhD thesis, I'll probably, well, I'll probably not be able to include empirical research, but after that, if I uh, stay in academia, which I would very much like to do, uh, I would be interested in, in, in looking into these kind of questions which could be reformulated as empirical and then tested. Well, they may not be solved by empirical research, but they could be informed by empirical research, and this, in my book, is, is quite okay. Um, so I, I too plan to stay in academia if, if I'm able. Um, but with philosophy of science, it's a bit difficult to find work in, in fact in industry. If you're not in academia, the skills that you have in philosophy of science are of course good, you have good analytical skills and all that, but you don't have, or most of the times you mm, not, don't necessarily have a practically applicable skill. That's why uh, you can pick 
of some programming or something like that, like a side project, which also have, can help inform your uh, research into uh, philosophy of science. Uh, but that's that's a project that I have to pursue probably in the future. And uh, thank you for that for this lovely talk. It was it was a a very thank pleasant, you for your time, yeah. pleasant discussion, and I wish you good luck with your research. And I look towards more collaboration between philosophy of science and, and computer science. Yeah, I think that there is a, a venue worth pursuing. We have, we have exactly mathematics to, to join us. Mathematics is a form of philosophy and computer science is a form of mathematics. So we are not that far apart, I guess. Absolutely. I agree. Okay, thank you.